you, everybody, for getting up early and hanging out with us. And I hope you're well caffeinated because we are. Because we're going to jump into the deep end, as it were, of this and have an important conversation to start our day about change and um, about survival and about knowledge, what it takes to know New Orleans. It's going to start our entire conversation for the rest of the day. And I want you to know that we are going to come out. I'm going to come out and hang out with you. And so I want you to start thinking of really smart in questions for this incredibly intimidating panel. Starting with, <laughs> starting with Lola's Eric Eli. He's a writer and author. He's Nola born. He has been writing and thinking for a long time about race, culture, and social justice. He's one of the founders also of the Southern Foodways Alliance. Next to him, you just saw the amazing Maddie Lisen. Maddie Lisen, who aside from being an amazing poet, is one of five, was one of five national student poets in 2014. She is a rising Princeton freshman. She's heading there next month. And she just told me backstage the best part about the Princeton schedule is that there's a break right around Mardi Gras time. She's also a graduate of the Lusher Charter School. She was nine years old in 2005, writing poetry on the headboard of the bed in her bedroom, which was eventually ruined and washed away in Katrina. Min Nguyen is the founder, uh, Min is here, I'm sorry, I'm out of order, is the founder and executive director of the Vietnamese American Young Leaders of New Orleans. He's an environmental racism activist. He is interested in building the capacity of youth, but not just Vietnamese youth. He's also engaged in linking Latino, African American, and Caucasian communities. Chris Rose, who I skipped past there, or sitting next to uh, Maddie, is the author of the book One Dead in Attic, which says pretty much all we know about what happened. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He worked for the Times Picayune and he's currently the radio, a radio show host of a program called Soul Salvation. And Tracy Washington, who's sitting right here, is the president and CEO of the Louisiana Justice Center. She's a civil rights lawyer. She evacuated during the storm. She returned that December, and she remains focused on social justice. And Oliver Thomas, who I think is the last person I have here, Oliver Thomas is probably familiar to most of you. He is a former city council member. He is also a WBOK radio host, and his focus is on community engagement and city government. We have asked each of our panelists to give some thought to this whole idea of what it means to know New Orleans. For those of us who are not from here, who don't live here, who watched the entire, everything, the tales of survival ex kind of unfold at arm's length, it is interesting to us now to find out what we think we know and what people who have actually been fighting the fight do know. And I want to start with you, Lois, because you, you, in many ways, cross a lot of the paths that people outside of Washington think, outside of Washington, you can tell where I've been, outside of New Orleans think about uh, New Orleans and Katrina, which is culture and resilience and bouncing back and survival. But tell us, what do you know about New Orleans that we should know? Um, years ago, Ellis Marcellus said rather famously that in other places, culture comes down from on high and New Orleans just bubbles up from the side. I think that's the most telling, telling explanation of this city. Um, and if you think about it specifically in terms of the sidewalks, the second line parades, the street culture, that is so much a part of what makes this city different. Under normal circumstances, you'd assume that Rex, the king of carnival, is the most important part of this pageantry, when in fact it's these people who make this city more interesting than other places and make our parades more interesting. If you talk about our food, the usual explanation is that it comes from France, and that's why it's so good. Well, in fact, our food was very much preserved in Congo Square and is the food of West Africa, at least as much as it is the food of France. And again, understanding that our origins are not necessarily as highfalutin as some people might attempt to say that they are. Similarly with our music, again, Wynton Marcellus talks about how Louis Armstrong's bravura came in part from his efforts or his, what he learned from all the, the trumpet method books that he studied. But in addition to that sense of what the trumpet should sound like, he also was dealing with the kind of thing that Buddy Bold and other less trained musicians were dealing with. Similarly, Michael White talks about how uh, Sidney Bechet was attempting to emulate the sound of opera and all the vibrato in his, in his uh, saxophone. My point is that to understand the city, it helps to walk down St. Charles Avenue, Esplanade, and see those glorious mansions. 
But around the corner, in those smaller houses where the rest of us live, you get a great sense of this place. And finally, if you are inclined to blame all of our differences on France, bear in mind that <laughs> the Haitians were the last great influx of Francophone-speaking people to come here in 1810 after being kicked out of Cuba. The Haitians continue to pay and repay and re-repay for the revolution that made this city possible. Our population doubled after the Haitian Revolution by the influx of those people. And so much of our culture, so much of our way of being in the world, so much of our food comes from these people. Oliver Thomas, I want you to answer the question next. Oh, wow. Um, I am so glad I didn't follow that. Well, <laughs> I decided I'd switch it well, up a little bit. Well, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm glad I did because uh, Lola's did with the cultural. The thing everybody knows about New Orleans, good food, uh, great music, and all of those cultural things. We're the, but we also have the greatest collection of survivors in the history of the survival world. Uh, when people thought this city was safe, it was five or six times uh, more violent than most cities this size. When people talk about the good old days in the school system, we had fewer people that graduated. Uh, when people talk about the good old days, we were incarcerating more people per capita than any other place. But what it really means to New Orleans, and I love these people who said it, no New Orleans, but you know, if you really know New Orleans, you know Sister Street is the first street in the lower nine, and Duberell is the last. It's not Jordan Avenue in Delray. Uh, if you really know New Orleans, you know two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. McDonald's doesn't use that anymore, but I've been so conditioned by it. You know, that there's been a, a narrative created in this town that it may not mean it's, it's the truth about how everybody lives, but that's the burger that you're selling. So if you're really from New Orleans, you know that you can, we have more honor roll students in Angola and in, and, 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 and in the jail system per capita than just about any other place in America. So there's a struggle about the reality of this very special place that people know culturally but the existence for a lot of folk uh, uh, have always been not what they were even after Katrina, but before Katrina. You know that we had 95,000 people lived in public housing in a city with less than 500,000 people. You know that we averaged three and 400 and 200 murders a year for 20 years in a little city with less than five. And you know that no matter how good you did in school, you probably were going to work at the hotel. Tracy Washington, pick up on that. I'm setting you all up one by one. Um, so, good morning. Um, what does it mean to know New Orleans? What it means to know New Orleans is that I probably have connections with somebody at every single one of these tables where there's a New Orleanian, right? My boss is sitting over there, and yes, I'm going to make my 11 o'clock class at Dillard. Um, it means that for me, I don't go any place in this city and feel lonely or alone. It means that I don't care how many murders you have a year, 200, 300, 400. I can walk in and around Belfast and Short just like I can walk in the lower Ninth Ward. Now, though most people still know me as, oh, yeah, 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 you're the people's lawyer. I never feel unsafe. I know that somebody is going to look at my face and say, you Geraldine Washington's daughter, aren't you? Yeah. You're Lois Washington's daughter, aren't you? Or, you know, in the past 22 years, you're Jacob's mom. Okay, I'll take that one too. <laughs> we have ties in this city. Um, ties that go, you know, generations deep. And they cross color lines. You know, um, I'm a dark-skinned black woman, but, you know, there's some folks in my family that got red hair and probably related to some of the redheads out here, right? That's what's important about this city. There's this vibe, and, and it sustains us. Lots of people can, you know, move from city to city. Oh, I moved from New York, I moved to LA, I moved to Chicago, and they do just fine. I've lived lots of places and I do just fine, but I'm sustained here. And when we had Katrina and that disruption when we lost 100,000 black folk, and yeah, I'm going to be that person on the panel who's going to talk about racism, so just be ready. <coughs> um, 
we lost a significant part of what it is to be New Orleans. You can't replace 100,000 black folk with avatars, white folk who can come up here with a restaurant called Who That, Who That Burger, That Dog, That Cat, <laughs> That Whatever, and say it's New Orleans. And I miss that. I miss that. Chris, let's talk about sustenance. What's wrong with that dog? <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> oh, Gwen, what was the question? Well, oh. she was talking about right. how, how New I'll, Orleans sustains us. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up where, where, where Ms. Washington said uh, it's true, because sitting out here, I was looking out, and uh, I know somebody at every table here, and so they know somebody else who knows somebody else, and we all... We all do intersect here. Um, it, it's a hard and, and broad question to answer. I'm going to bring it back to two very simple tropes, but I, I think they're accurate. Um, and that would be uh, Mardi Gras and, and the Superdome on Sundays in the fall. The Superdome on Sundays in the fall is an amazing um, cosmic social experiment that nobody could replicate if they tried to. It is where all races, genders, ages, socio, cultural, economic, educational barriers seem to be stripped away and everybody is there for one reason and for one purpose. And it's crazy to watch. It's a beautiful thing. I have been reliving the past couple days. I was involved with this ESPN thing yesterday, so I've been going through the Gleason moment and the Monday night football thing. But that was sure the extreme of it but what happens in that in that stadium every sunday afternoon which unfortunately i rarely get to go to i you know i'm i don't i don't roll like that i i, I go to games i used to go to games when i got sent there for work otherwise I, I watch them on tv but boy to be in that building on those sunday afternoons and watch the way everything is stripped away in the city the barriers the prejudices the the, the, every, everything's gone. And watch the way everybody interacts. And I always think when I'm walking outside that building, man, if we could just keep this going outside this building, if we could carry this outside and live like this every day, because it's all the same people. It's all of us, right? It's all the same people. And go out, and I guess we, ret I don't know, we re retreat to our, our, our barriers and our lives. And the truth is, I don't want to denigrate it too much. I think, you know, I've lived other cities. We don't have everything fixed here. Nobody's ever going to have everything fixed here. But I think we try harder than most places. I really do. And I'll, I'll translate that. I don't want to take up too much time to the other trope, which is, which is Mardi Gras, the same thing. You go down to your same street corner year after year, and it's the same people and it, usually they're not even from the neighborhood you will you're not from the neighborhood you showed up there not we can't all live on st charles avenue right so we just go we set up where we set up and year after year there's the same people there and this was one of the things i, I did notice in the phenomenon after after uh katrina that was sort of sort of painful was where people showed up and that first mardi gras and the second one after it and maybe the third People look over and, and they realize, hey, where are those guys? They didn't, you didn't even know their names, but you watched the children grow up. You knew what, what they ate. They bought the same things. You knew all their things that they did, the way they screamed and the way I, they acted. And, and I, I just thought, I know those are simple and maybe simplistic, uh, like I said, tropes or memes, as the kids say today. <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't, that's, well, let that's me, all. Well, let me, let, me, let me pick up on that, because you've made the case that we're more alike than different. Um, others in the panel have made this, the case that there's a lot of difference, and especially the way we view what recovery overcoming is. I want to go to Nguyen, because, to Min, because he um, represents a part, a swath of New Orleans that most people didn't realize existed. 
and that was affected in a very specific way environmentally that others were not, or at least that was never talked about. And now in the 10 years since, does it change the way you see the city? Yeah, definitely change. Um, just the fact that, like, yeah, before Katrina, nobody knew that Vietnamese folks lived in New Orleans, right? Some people knew about Dong Phuong, the restaurant, the bakery. Um, but other than that, um, I think Katrina really um, lifted our community when, uh, when the city was trying to basically make our community green space to, to build a, an airport, right? And um, as, as, a, as a community of refugees coming to, leaving Vietnam and actually being refugees twice, like from North Vietnam to South Vietnam, from South Vietnam to United States, and being kicked, like being displaced again, I think um, for us, our, our community, we, we had to resist. We had to tell them like, no, like this is it. Like we can't move again. We can't, we can't, have to, uh, we, we can't be displaced again. And I think that really um, galvanized not only the Vietnamese folks, but also like the black folks, the white folks, the Latino folks, and, and saying that, hey, we need to stand together and unite and fight. They can't, they can't do that to us again. And Displace, the, displacement became a, a real unifying theme in a way. Yeah, yeah, and I think for us it's just like, you know, we, we, we must fight, you know, we might fight, we, we, we must fight the, the institutional and environmental racism that we, we, we were facing. And I think from there, um, because of the fight and because, you know, we also won, so yay, right? Um, we also was able to, to come together and like, let's rebuild the city together the way how we need to. But obviously for us, we, we continue to, to face a lot of challenges and barriers because like New Orleans East was not in the plan, right? We, it took us, what, seven, eight years to get a hospital. I mean, I think the schools, a lot of the schools were, were, were being closed down and we just had to fight to reopen a lot of them. And I think uh, from there, you know, we also have a lot of diversity. A lot of the Latino folks have moved into the New Orleans East community as well. And I think, you know, yes, New Orleans is a very diverse city, but in a way, we're not as, like, racially uh, acceptant, right? Um, if you go down, okay, I just got married, so um, I went to, like, Barcelona, and when I went there, like, they really, really um, embraced, like, tourism. Like, you, had, you could get menus in different languages. And I was like, why can't New Orleans do this, right? And I really want to see that happen, and I'm, yeah, I'm calling it out right now. It's like, we have so many people who come into to New Orleans. We have like 92 million people who come in to New Orleans, and I think that's something that we, we need to embrace. We need to embrace the culture, embrace the, 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 the differences that we have here. And I think like, you know, for us, our community, we're, we're one of them, and we need to be recognized and letting folks know that, hey, we, we do exist, and we need to be a part of it as well. You see, that's interesting what you said about embracing the culture, because when people think about culture in New Orleans, they often think black and white. Mm -hmm. And there's something in Maddie's poem that struck me, that maybe it struck you too, where she said, they told me I was black, and therefore, finish that sentence for us. I became black. Um, and I realized that evacuating for Katrina, uh, going to my small elementary school in League City, Texas, whose mascot uh, was the Hurricanes which is fabulous. Uh, Beats the rebels. <laughs> but I would say that I'm a child of New Orleans. I'm still in that stage in my life because I haven't lived anywhere else. And I think that knowing New Orleans, you're born, when you're born into it, it's kind of like loving a dog uh, as much as you love it and you see it as this unique individual. There's a part of you that deep down, no matter what, as much as you fight it, you know that you'd be happy with any other animal, if that makes sense. But then you take your first trip away from New Orleans. And I will never forget the first time I was in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was walking down the street with my mom. And I, it was the first trip that I really remember, and it was the first time I could like look up when I was walking down the sidewalk. I didn't have to look for cracks uh, or potholes. <laughs> and it was one of the first times where I 
couldn't, we always walk in the middle of the street because, you know, if anything's going to happen to you, you want to walk in the middle of the street. I was walking on the sidewalk for one of the first times. Uh, but then you come back and that love kind of changes. You start to love it like a grandparent where you can't really comprehend why the city is so messed up so old, so damaged, uh, and, you, and you kind of don't really imagine losing it, because even as a child, you don't kind of see you losing a grandparent, but it's, it's still there. And then something like Katrina happens, and you start to love the city like a parent, and you start to worry and as much as you love it, and as much as you always expect it to be around, there's that fear and that anxiety that's gonna be gone. You know when, you're, when your parents don't come home and they, they stay out a little bit later than they said they would and that, and that bell hits you and you start to get a little anxious? It's like that and you can't get past it. And, yeah. I have to say, Maddie, it's been a while since I worried about my parents, but I like that idea that you think we still do. Um, I would love to get questions now from the audience. There are people around with microphones, and I obviously have one, and there's already... But you're right here, so I'm going to start with him. It, well, wait a second. We, we, would, we really need you to have a microphone. So if you will just wait a second, then I'll come to you next. Thank you. My name is Ruthie Frierson from New Orleans. And I'm inspired by all of you. But Ming, I wanted to share one of the most inspirational moments of my life with Katrina. And that was when I went back down to bring back New Orleans meeting. And there were hundreds and hundreds of you all with Father Vin from, the, from um, New Orleans East. And Father Vin went down to City Hall to get permits for people who wanted to rebuild. And they said, well, how many permits do you want? He said, 600. <laughs> and within a day or two, he had those permits filled out and back at City Hall. And I think all of you have been participating in Katrina since then, but I, you know, and, and, and before, but I just wanted to share that moment of inspiration. Thank you all. Thank you. Can you stand up and tell me who you are and what your question is? Uh, good morning. My name is Stephen Kennedy. Um, more so, a comment slash question. You all talked about the culture inclusion. I, I, I think that was a recurring theme, the culture inclusion. But also, my question to some of the panelists is, how do you all talk about those socioeconomic disparities here in the city of New Orleans? I seem to find that people kind of jump around that conversation. And how can you all, what would be you all's ideal New Orleans if the socioeconomic disparities can be uh, closed? Oliver Thomas, I want you to take that, and then Tracy. I mean, an ideal New Orleans would be where the uh, post-Katrina $71 billion of investment, uh, projections of $200 billion investments in the next, next seven to ten years in the Gulf Coast from West Florida to Lake Charles would be that the disparity gap in earnings between the races wouldn't be 10 percent worse uh, in the last five or six years. Uh, uh, it would be that for people who tout uh, success in charter schools that the kids who matriculated through the charter school system uh, would be better off socially and, and, and economically instead of 37 percent unemployment, 36 percent out of a little poverty level. So if good schools means just passing tests but not good jobs and not part of this economic windfall, then that should matter. It should be that the 52 percent of African American men who are unemployed, it, and, and you have that statistics because they went to get jobs. And then in that 52 percent, 14 percent pass the drug test, have transportation, and have degrees or certificates in the area of discipline. It would say that, and the, the, the great playwright August Wilson, when he writes about two trains running, he talks about the dualities of life. So when will we come to grips with that? There's one train on one track going in one direction, and there's another train on another track with a, the with a community going in a whole other direction. Tracy? Shoot, what's left, right? Um, I said yesterday when I, when I was talking with the group that we're going to spend a week um, touting the regrowth, the redevelopment, 
how beautiful it is New Orleans has become. Um, and folks will go down St. Charles Avenue, or go down Elysian Fields, go down Esplanade, go eat at Little Dizzy's, do, do that. But then take that route three blocks into the communities, right? When you go three blocks in, you're going to see that, hopefully, if you get a chance to talk with some folks, you're going to see the economic disparity. You know, 50 percent of our black children are still living in poverty. We still have that in New Orleans. It's bigger than it was pre-Katrina. Pre-Katrina, it was ugly. It's still ugly, right? We got a jail that's overpopulated and a sheriff who wants to build more jail space. Right? Everybody else in the country trying to get less jail. We got special education and children, they say, oh, education is doing fine. Every single day. I get the people's lawyer mantra because people know I'm always going to answer that phone and I'm always going to fight. That God help me, that's why I want to move, so I can get a break. But every single week, I get parents calling me because their special needs child has been ignored in somebody's school. Every week. That's nuts. I mean, you, you have rights to have education. So what does it mean? It means it, in, in New Orleans, when we're talking about this disparity, that we tell the truth. I used to tell people, I'm make, I'm, I'm say this and be quiet. You know, pre-Katrina, pre um, I weighed 260 pounds, actually a little bit more. And, um, and my friends and a good friend of mine said, Tracy, you were big fine. No, I was fat. I was a football player. Um, I had to look at myself in the mirror and then say, OK, I got to do something. If we face the facts, the real facts about the city, and then just take it minute. step by step by step, we're going to tackle this today. We're not going to eat. We're not going to eat French fries this week. We're not going to have those sodas. We're going to tackle one problem and resolve it at a time. We're not going to lie. You know, just if we would just stop lying about the fact that all these black men who are hanging out on street corners don't want to work. I do a little redevelopment of houses. You know who I okay, get Tracy, to do this? I get these guys who are just on the corners who just want to get a little money. Tracy, we have I'm, a I'm lot sorry. of things we want to cover. I'm, I'm sorry. And a lot okay. of people who want to talk. You said look for your I can say I set you off. I understand. <laughs> can I, can I, can I, we have a question right here. If we can keep the questions short and the answers short, we can get a few more in. My name is Omar Kashmir. I, I, I have a statement, not particularly a question. Keep it, uh, keep I'm with it. the Katrina Foundation. Let's make it short. It, the Katrina Foundation was started right after Hurricane Katrina. This is one of the s seven of many books we have in, inside the Katrina Museum of 10,000 families that was trapped in a convention center. When you ask people, where were the people after Katrina? They're going to say the Superdome because that's what they put in your mind. Do you know the Katrina's list? Anyone in here knows about the Katrina's list? Well, we have a museum that's in the historic uh, Treme area, 2525 DeSoto Street. You can visit us online at Katrina National Memorial okay. Foundation. Okay, you got your plug in. Thank you very much. <laughs> Come on. So uh, speaking as someone who moved here 10 years ago and, and immediately fell in love with the city, and I moved here to run Second Harvest Food Bank, again, I'd like to ask a question about the paradoxes that you've all been describing. How is it that we can have this incredible economic resurgence that we all love, these great hopeful signs in our community, and yet have completely recovered or, or have poverty rates just as high as we did, even having lost population, poverty rates just as high as before the storms. Lois? I think our measures of progress are based on how quickly rich people are getting richer. <laughs> We need new statistics. Nice, brief Sound answer, because we have another day. question in the back. Shocked me. Right back here. Good job, Lou. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jean Nathan with Creative Alliance of New Orleans. I just wanted to give a shout out for the artists of the city who came back very early along with the restaurants and helped us all believe that we would come back. The first time you went to a restaurant and there was a jazz band there, 
it warmed your heart. It said we were coming back the first time you went to a parade, the first time you went to the Jazz Fest. And um, with a visual performing, media, film, all of them have been hand in glove with everybody else. Oliver and Lolis can speak to this. They've been very much involved. Actually, everybody up there. But um, I, I, at the same time, we don't have the resources we need. It's partially because of our economic base. But I'd just like someone to address um, how we might chase down some more sustained funding to support all the artists who are really struggling now, even though they're a big part of the city, they're still struggling. I mean, you know, bring a, uh, an actor and someone who writes in theater now, well, politics acting is the same thing, uh, but now I work in that industry. Uh, I think you're absolutely correct. Uh, actually, the uh, artists and entertainers were intentional after Katrina. Many uh, uh, theater groups held plays, they did productions, uh, in spite of the fact that the city uh, wasn't repopulated. So the question is, how do we find sustained funding for a lot of those groups? You know, I, I, I tweeted a piece not too long ago after, you know, and you know, I went on vacation so I got a chance to study a little bit and learn a little more. Uh, I tweeted that Katrina in many cases was more humane than uh, philanthropists, builders, and FEMA. Uh, because a lot of the tra traditional cultural uh, organizations are actually being excluded for what's new and what's trendy right now. A lot of the historical African-American nonprofits who fought in neighborhoods for years are being left out for what's trendy and what's popular right now. Look, New Orleans, this is, there's no other place that I, I want to be. Uh, but we've been on a roller coaster for a long time because we've practiced insanity. Uh, we've wanted to promote the festival but not deal with the people who can't afford to go to the festival. And in many cases, that's the artisans. I believe that, you know, inter there are entertainers and people, musicians and artists who work in the French Quarter uh, who can't afford to park or get parking tickets and all the money that they made for their gig, they lose because they can't have an affordable place to park anywhere. So, you know, uh, and, and I think uh, uh, Tracy, is right about when are we going to be intentional? Look, in the, in the greatest city in the world with the greatest culture and the greatest people, you know, from Ruthie Fireson to Greg Rattler to Stephen Kennedy, we have the most wonderful people in the world. But when are we going to stop saying that the second line, even though I'm smiling, behind that smile is a whole lot of pain? We have time for another question, and then I'd like to hear from the whole panel. So somebody's back there behind that light. Oh, hi. Hi, my name is Ashana Begar, and I'm with um, Education Justice Project. My question is, how do we get um, black Native New Orleanians to re-engage in a political process um, when they're not being hired? And we're touting um, New Orleans as a success, and clearly we're left out of the ep economic boom. So how do we get them to believe in politicians again when they feel um, unseen and unheard? If I can find a way, if I, because this is the final question, if I can find a way to rephrase it so that the broader it can include the whole panel, being unseen and unheard is not unique to African Americans. It's not unique to people in New Orleans. But right now, that's the subject at hand when you get right down to it. People feel like they survived the worst experience of their lives, the worst experience this country in many ways experienced. The idea of a major American city drowning is something that I've never been able to get out of my head, the idea that it was possible. And now we're on the other side of it 10 years later. How do we still be seen? How do we still get seen, whether it's for jobs, for opportunity, for restoration of the culture, for restoration of a broader notion of what New Orleans is? I'll start with you, Lois, and I want the whole panel to take that on. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, What's striking when we talk about the assistance that has come to this city post-Katrina, it has all been very much top-down. So they had big companies who were given all this money to do the rebuilding, and then they hired other big companies who then hired other big companies. Sounds like you did a great story about how much money the big company was being paid to put a roof on a house and how much the actual roofer got. I think that had generally been our approach to the recovery, and it was, of course, the approach of American capitalism, the idea that the big people should make all the decisions. And in a, in a more microcosmic sense, we tout all these great things that have been done in education, or allegedly great things that have been done in education. The first thing that happened post-Katrina in the realm of education was the firing of all the teachers of the Orleans Parish Public School System. 
So we are attempting to improve the lives of these children by firing their mothers, their sisters, their aunts, their uncles. That concept that it is possible to have these pronouncements on high in order to help these people be low has been a big part of our problem. Our conception of who we're helping is skewed. Maddie, you were nine when Katrina hit. You've lived most of your life post-Katrina. So looking at it now, what do you see? I can say that I will never own a house one day because I had to watch my parents lose everything. I can say that I have been of voting age for more than a year. I haven't filled out my voter registration forms because I don't trust politicians because my parents voted, they paid their taxes, and they still lost their homes. And I would say that a lot of people my age and older that went through that experience have the same feelings and the same beliefs. And I can't tell you a way to fix it. I would say that the turnout of the Bernie Sanders event uh, last month is a good indication that people are getting riled up in terms of my generation in Louisiana. But at the same time, um, there's just this overwhelming anxiety of having been raised in that type of environment, of kind of just now processing it. Because the first days of New Orleans after Katrina, I mean, that was, that was phenomenal, being a child, because we couldn't really process what was happening. Our parents were picking up the pieces, so that just left us with a playground of abandoned houses and graveyards. But now, looking at it from where we are, we don't know what to do with this world, and we don't know how to piece it together, because our parents had to deal with it back then. And I don't have an answer as to how we're going to do it now. That's actually kind of heartbreaking. Chris Rose. Wow. All right, let me try to break this into three parts. The first is sort of uh, self-congratulatory. I want to tell you, um, I've done a lot of panels in the last 10 years. A lot of fucking <laughs> panels. As the foremost expert and authority on New Orleans despair, I want to say, uh, this group I'm sitting up here with, this, this is amazing to sit with you, you guys. It is so wonderful to be in a group where actually for the first time in my life, I actually wanted to listen more than I wanted to talk. So I just want to say that about you guys. And two other points. Uh, what I've tried to tell myself and a lot of other people, you talk about the invisibility of it and how do we get noticed. It comes down to this. To everyone who has Katrina fatigue, who doesn't want to hear about it anymore, and is wrestling with this, these issues, you know, how do we sustain this? How do we get noticed? Don't worry. Because after August 30th, you won't hear about it again for 15 years. We are a country who fetishizes anniversaries. And we are at 10 now, and 15 doesn't mean anything, and 20 is not a gold watch. So if you're tired of it, don't worry. August 30th, you're in the free. And I want to do one thing, not to counter what Lola said, but to sort of, if you talk from the top down, I want to speak from the bottom up. The only reason we are here on this stage right now and any of us are here in this audience is due to people who are not in this room, to nobody who is in this room. And it's not the corporations, it's not government. It is the hundreds of thousands and maybe millions, I don't know. But how many people we will never know, we will never know their names, their church groups, their schools, their families, their business groups, whoever the hell they were, who came down here, bus load after bus load, plane load after plane load, van after van, year after year to this day. They came down here, they tore houses apart, and then they rebuilt them. And I don't know who the hell they are, but I wish we could line all them up in the Superdome someday 
and give them a freaking party because that's why we're here. We're not here because of all the government billions of dollars that helped and the corporations helped, but this would not have happened without our fellow citizens who we will never know who came down here not expecting anything, but thank you. And I would just argue. And I would just argue the fact that those people came when it wasn't an anniversary and that they kept coming and they've kept coming and will keep coming kind of makes the point that people do do things for the right reasons and they focus even when the spotlight goes away. Tracy. So how do we get noticed? Well, we get loud. Um, I, I evacuated as a single mom with a, a 12 year old. Um, and a jacked up car and an American Express and a law degree. So that was, that was an awful combination for the evil ones who didn't want black folk back. Because that law degree meant I can get into any court and fight for anybody. And the American Express company said, you can pay us when you can pay us. That was great. Um, you will vote because you will get angry. You will buy a house because you're going to want a homestead. And you're going to say doggone it. I am not going to live being forced to be resilient. I don't want to hear that word again. I am tired of people saying, y'all are so resilient. Resilient means you can do something to me. No, I'm not resilient. I have a right not to be resilient. How do we do this? We keep fighting. You know, I'm here and you know, I told OT, I'll be the one turning off the light. This city is not going anywhere without me. And so I, I say to everybody else who has that same spirit, we keep fighting. I say to you, um, where is Anisha? We, we keep fighting. We keep fighting. And we demand that our voice be heard. You know, we just demand it. I got a law degree, 25925. Can't take it away from me. That's my bar now. I'll sue to be heard. <laughs> and I mean that. Man? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, for, so I mean, I, I shared the story earlier, and, and I, mean, I agree with you. We just continue to fight. You know, we, we fought to, so we could stay here in New Orleans and not be dis, displaced again. And for us, I mean, I think one of the things I really want to share is that, like, we have, again, like, we have a lot of immigrants who moved into um, our city, and, and they also need to have a voice as well. And so we've been continuing to, to fight um, to make sure that there's language access, you know, for, for for our people. I mean, there's a lot of the Latinos who moved into New Orleans and re helped rebuild our city. But the thing is, they don't, they're not being heard right now, right? So that's one of the things that we definitely wanted to, to address. And the other thing is that I am so sick of people telling, telling our narrative and our stories, yeah. right? Even this whole entire week of Katrina, uh, 10, I, I'm kind of sad that the people who have been affected and impacted the most are not being at these events or not even invited to be at these events. And they're the ones who we're celebrating or we're commemorating. There's so many people who have made so much money off of them as well in our city. And the, the thing is, they're continuing to be voiceless. So I say like, we have to continue to fight. We have to organize. We have to take over our own media, right? We have to change our narrative. And that's the reason why we're being pushed down right? We've been pushed away because people, right now people are telling our stories. And that's so sad. It's so sad that, that, that that's what we have, we, we, that we're, we have to deal with. And, and I think, you know, for, for, for us it's just, yes, we got to fight, we got to organize, we got to stick together, we got to work together to make sure that our voice are being heard. Oliver. The partnership with the, uh, uh, the media, the business community, and the political community has to be stronger and more intentional uh, than ever. Uh, we have to use, be able to use public policy to incentivize smart growth in areas that are struggling, uh, not just when they're gentrified, but before it comes to, to that point. We have to be intentional about CBDG funding and targeting funding to create ownership, home ownership in communities for indigenous people or natives who've been in those neighborhoods that now have a value. We have to create other economic hubs or engines, uh, not just the downtown and the French Quarter, we have swaths of land in New Orleans East. Uh, New Orleans East Hospital is a perfect example. We know we live in, in, in Cancer Alley. We live in a region because of our diets where we have chronic illnesses. 
Uh, why not create a, a research development area around New Orleans East Hospital that deals with African American or chronic illnesses that are indigenous to this region? We shouldn't just have one biomedical uh, research center. And then uh, uh, P Professor Tony Felton Earls, who I, I study with, who's the father of collective efficacy, is from New Orleans. He talks about how do we create not just resiliency, but a sense of citizenship and co community in distressed communities where they have responsibility and take responsibility, not just rely on politicians, not just rely on so-called leaders, but there's a sense of ownership, even in terms of uh, 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 how many problems they have. And then in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, 43 and 19, God says, I will do a new thing in you. Uh, we have to stop practicing insanity. We've tried that before. Maybe it's time to put the poor people, the children, the elderly, and the working class in the front of the line. Hmm. Well, we wanted to hear the voices of people who have lived here who have done this. But we also want to hear your voices. If you are not in the room, if you're watching us by live stream or on C-SPAN, please feel free to tweet to Facebook to use the hashtag Atlantic NOLA to tell us your, to let us hear your voice so you don't feel excluded from this conversation. And if you are in this room, you will find on your tables cards which are written to no New Orleans is. I want you to fill those out. You can hang them on the bulletin board on the wall outside of the ballroom and we can look at them as the day goes on and it, hopefully that will continue to spark conversations. Please join me again in thanking this amazing panel. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Oh, get it.